Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. I am Trace and this is episode 2 of 5 on cloning. Make sure you stick around, there's a surprise guest coming later, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, yesterday we talked about how cloning happens in nature, it happens naturally, so make sure you check that out. Today we're going to talk about when we started cloning things artificially, and in the future we're going to talk about the future of cloning. We're going to talk about the ethics of cloning and a whole bunch of other stuff, so make sure you subscribe. We're talking about today lab-based cloning, artificial cloning. It seems like a really complicated process. To be honest, it's actually not. Like much science, when you get right down to it, there's a point where once we figured out this one thing, it just blossomed into this whole new branch of science. That was a really great analogy that I didn't even mean to do. So we first figured out cloning actually a long time ago. The first demonstration of artificial embryo twinning was way back in 1885. A guy named Hans Adolf Edward Dreisch tried this out and he used sea urchin cells. He was able to demonstrate that it's possible to separate the cells when they're very young, when it's like embryonic and that each cell would grow into a complete sea urchin two sea urchins, but it would have just been one, but he separated them. In 1902, the first artificial embryo twinning in a vertebrate happened. This is with Hans Spiemann, and he tried to split a salamander cell, which are actually, those cells are more sticky than sea urchins. And what he did was he fashioned a tiny noose out of a strand of baby hair, and he used it to successfully separate the cell. And it worked, but that technique can't be done with more advanced embryos. So at this point, they knew cloning was possible, because they would take an embryo and they were able to split it into two at an early enough stage into the development that it essentially was an artificial twin, right? Cloning is possible. However, only up to a certain stage in development. Then in 1928, Spiemann discovered what is called nuclear transfer. The nucleus of a cell, if you remember from grade school biology, the nucleus from an early embryonic cell directs the complete growth of an organism. So in embryos, there's only so many nuclei. And when you're in an egg, you've only got one. So he found out by using the same noose technique with a fertilized salamander egg, he could move the nucleus and move it around inside of the egg there. And that meant if you could move it around, maybe you could take it out and swap in a different one. In 1952, they did that for the first time. Robert Briggs and Thomas King went and they transferred the nucleus from an early tadpole embryo into a frog egg that had its nucleus removed. So they took the nucleus out of a frog egg, so it was just an empty egg. Then they took the nucleus from an early tadpole embryo and put it into the empty egg, and the egg grew into a tadpole. Pretty impressive, actually. And that proved three different things. One, nuclear transfer was a viable cloning technique. Two, the nucleus directs its cell growth and cell development. And three, it's better to clone earlier than later. Moving on to 1958, nuclear transfer from a differentiated cell was first done. John Gurdon transplanted the nucleus of a tadpole intestinal cell. So they took the nucleus out of an intestine cell from a tadpole. They put it into an empty frog egg. They'd taken the nucleus out. By the way, that's called enucleated. And they created tadpoles that were genetically identical to the intestinal donor. This is known as nuclear transfer, and it worked out, and it's pretty huge. It proved that nuclei from somatic cells in a fully developed animal, so just a regular cell, they could just take any nucleus, pop it into an egg, and clone something. It proved that cells retain all genetic material, even as they divide and they differentiate throughout the organism. They have all of the blueprints for the whole thing in every single one of your nuclei. In 1975, the first mammalian embryo was created by nuclear transfer. Uh, mammalian egg cells, also fun science fact, they're actually smaller, and they're harder to manipulate than salamander and reptilian egg cells that they'd used previous experiments with. But J. Derek Bromhall found a way to manipulate the cells and he used a glass pipette as a tiny little straw, transferred the nucleus from a rabbit embryo into an enucleated rabbit egg. Remember enucleated means they took the nucleus out. And after a few days, it worked out, advanced embryo developed. So they started the cloning process of a rabbit. In 1984, the first mammal was actually created by nuclear transfer. Steen Willidson developed a chemical process which would separate one cell from a lamb embryo. Then he used an electric shock to fuse that cell within a nucleated egg cell. And then the new cell started dividing. They placed those lamb embryos into the womb of a surrogate sheep and bam, 
They got three little live little lammy babykins. What this experiment proved in 1984 was that cloning of a mammal was possible and that the clone could grow into a fully developed organism. Three years later in 1987, Neil First, Randall Prather, and Willard Eyestone used that same method and produced two cloned calves, adding cows to the list of things that they could clone with nuclear transfer. And then in 1996, nuclear transfer was created using laboratory cells. Ian Wilmot and Keith Campbell used donor nuclei, just the nuclei, from a different source. They cultured sheep cells. They kept the cells alive in a lab. Then they grew an embryo clone, essentially. This is crazy. It's, I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's hard enough to get you know, from one cell right to the other cell, let alone keeping those things alive in a lab and holding on to them for a long period of time and then proving that you can still use them later. It might be possible, they think now, because of this in 1996, to use modified cells to create transgenic animals. You don't have to pull the nucleus out of one thing and put it right into the other. You can take the nucleus, you can kind of play with it a little bit, add some genes from you know, some other animal into this one, which now we know of today, uh, using CRISPR and things, which you can check out in our other episodes on that. And you mix genes from one animal to another, you create a transgenic animal. So like a cow that produces insulin for diabetics right in their milk. That same year, those same people created a lamb by transferring the nucleus from an adult sheep udder cell into an enucleated egg. And after 277 tries, they produced an embryo that was carried to term and out popped Dolly took a while. We've all heard about Dolly, super famous, super successful, complicated, very complicated organism that they were able to grow from an enucleated egg and the adult sheep utter nucleus and all sorts of stuff. She brought a lot of controversies over cloning and it was a big media like bonanza. And it also brought stem cell research into the public eye. And this is only up until 1997. We haven't mentioned stem cells yet, but we will mention them tomorrow. Things are still happening in cloning. They're only getting more and more crazy. People are bringing up all sorts of ethical questions, which we're going to come back to later in this week. So make sure you subscribe. Do you remember when you heard about Dolly? Tell us about it down in the comments. You can also find us over on Twitter. We're at TestTube. I'm at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to TestTube Plus, and we'll see you tomorrow.